Okay, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. For some of you, I know um, either on the West Coast or Mountain Time, I know this still might be um, <laughs> still might be the morning for you guys, but good afternoon to some folks too. Um, my name is Chrissy and I work at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Uh, we are gonna actually transition into another little webinar room area so you guys can hopefully see me in one second. That's the goal. Um, so let me have that transition for a minute. Okay, so I'm going to start my webcam so you all can actually see me and hey Kim, wave. <laughs> this is my uh, um, co-worker Kim Guys, who will be talking a little bit, um, telling you about our special exhibit uh, here at the museum. Um, but uh, we are so glad you guys are joining us today uh, here to talk about uh, Japanese American imprisonment and internment. Just a few kind of uh, housekeeping sort of reminders before we get started. Below us, in this, you know, below this webcam here, you all can see um, a Q&A pod. Uh, that works a little bit different from the chat pod that you guys were just using, but um, you might have questions for us, for Kim and for our uh, other special guest, Brian, as he comes on. Um, if you do, what we'll have you guys do is type in that Q&A pod. At the end, we will have a little Q&A session with Kim and Brian. Uh, and we'll try to pick out some of your questions to ask them. Um, and so uh, please feel free to type in questions at any point. Um, teachers, as I said earlier, uh, make sure all of your programs are closed out on your computer. That makes Adobe Connect run a lot faster. Um, you might also, if, if we're coming through a little too quiet or a little too loud, um, there is, if you see at the top meeting bar um, there on the screen, you'll see a little uh, uh, icon that looks like a speaker. If you click on that arrow next to that icon, you're able to adjust your speaker volume. Uh, you also have those internal controls on your computer as well. Also, um, when I'm done talking here, I'll be manning our second computer over here. So if you do have any tech issues, you can also type in that Q&A pod and I'll try to address them as best as I possibly can. Um, but uh, we're so glad to welcome you here to the museum today. You saw some images in the lobby and now, of course, one here of the National World War II Museum. Uh, this is actually our U.S. Freedom Pavilion, the Boeing Center, that opened a little over a year ago uh, here at the museum that you see on screen. Uh, in that lobby, you also saw some images from our latest special exhibit that Kim will talk about uh, in, just, in just a little bit. But my job here um, at the museum is to, uh, is to talk, uh, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an intro. Um, uh, about um, our special exhibit and um, a little bit of intro to the content, to the history. Um, actually, I just had someone ask me, where is the museum located? Maybe I didn't even say that. We're in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to spend today is five minutes or so reviewing um, the background and the history of Japanese American imprisonment and internment. So we're all kind of on the same page for when our special guests uh, come in and join us today. So uh, here's our agenda, just so we all know. Uh, so of course my overview, uh, just to spend a couple minutes on that. And then uh, Kim will give us an inside look at our latest special exhibit from barbed wire to battlefields, Japanese American experiences in World War II. And then I will give a shout to our um, uh, presenter who's pretty far away from here in the museum in California, Brian Comey Dempster. He's a poet professor and editor, and he will be uh, sharing uh, some items from his uh, uh, poetry, but also um, some other anthologies as well today. And then we will have a student Q&A with uh, Kim and Brian, and that's when I'll be taking some of the questions that you'll hopefully be asking in that Q&A pod um, and asking those questions to them. And then we'll, we'll obviously close with some reminders, but also for you students out there, we have have a poetry prompt for you guys, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, uh, you know, as we get you know closer and closer to uh, the end there. Okay, so um, my first question for you guys, and this actually brings up a poll question. Uh, I ask this question of students a lot here at the museum. Uh, does anybody know how the United States got involved in World War II? And um, I am going to put up a poll question. If you guys have seen this before, you maybe know how this works. Select on the answer that you think is right. And I'm going to give you a little bit of time to figure it out. And I might broadcast the results so you guys can see who's voting where. 
And it looks like our overwhelming majority here, um, it looks like you guys are voting yes. Uh, Japan attacked Hawaii, very good. And uh, that was um, December 7th of 1941. All right, great job, you guys. That was probably an easy poll question for you all. Um, this is a very famous front page of the Honolulu Star Bulletin, War, Oahu bombed by Japanese planes. Um, as some of you, of course, know, there's no TV, no internet back then, so news came in a little bit slower. You see that byline says, six known dead. But when the day was over, over 2,400 Americans died in the surprise attack. And then uh, this very famous speech happened the day after. Let me play it for you. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Okay, so some of you might recognize that voice. That was our then president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That was the day 8th, on December 8th of 19, uh, day after, excuse me, on December 8th of 1945. Um, there, in that famous day of infamy speech, he is asking Congress to declare war on Japan, which, which happens. And now the United States is, is thrown into World War II. And, you know, um, our country changes in many different ways, including in the way that, of course, we're going to examine today. Um, quickly, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, fear and war hysteria led to propaganda that targeted the Japanese, um, which used, as you guys can see here, offensive racial stereotypes and, and slurs um, and offensive language. These tactics, you know, they were used to paint the Japanese as the ruthless enemy and even to separate or single out uh, Japanese residents and, Jap and the Japanese American population here in the United States. Uh, and then shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, actually just two months after the attack, um, President Roosevelt signs this Executive Order 9066, um, which allowed the Secretary of War to, and this is a quote, prescribe military areas in such extent that he or the appropriate military commander may determine from which any or all persons may be excluded. All right, that sounds maybe a little, <laughs> a little bit confusing. But what that actually means is that people can be excluded or moved out of areas that are considered militarily important, like uh, for the West Coast, like coastlines. However, the only group that was ever moved out of, the, out of these restricted areas were Japanese and Japanese Americans. Uh, Japanese residents, which we call Issei, not American citizens, and their children, Nisei, American citizens, were forcibly removed from their homes. Many had to give up their businesses, of course, their, their homes, possessions within the matter of days or weeks. Uh, this is uh, what you see on the screen, probably one of the more famous images um, of this time period, um, instructions for, for leaving your homes, leaving your businesses, um, and going to what you'll see in a second, uh, to a, a remote uh, camp. Um, so here's some of the numbers behind it, you guys. 110,000. Japanese and Japanese Americans forcibly removed from their homes in California, Oregon, and Washington. Over 60% were American citizens. So those Nisai um, children, 60%. Uh, so uh, that's over half. Brought to, there are 10 uh, very remote and hastily built camps, mostly in the American West, but there's a few even here in the South, uh, uh, near, you know, relatively near us in New Orleans. And uh, not one Japanese American was ever convicted of sabotage or espionage. Now, there were 10, as I said, remote camps where uh, these uh, Isai and, uh, Isai and Nisei were uh, brought to uh, here in the United States uh, for almost the duration of World War II. Uh, there is Hart Mountain in Wyoming, so where you guys see the little um, red points there on the screen, Minidoka in Idaho, uh, Tule Lake in Manzanar in California, uh, and Tule Lake and Manzanar in California, excuse me, uh, Poston and Gila River in Arizona, Topaz in Utah, Granada in Colorado, and uh, a little nearer to us here in New Orleans, uh, Rower and Jerome in Arkansas, which you can see uh, on the screen as well. Now, what I want to play for you now, we've seen, um, you know, talked about it a little bit, but I'm sure you want to see what it might have looked like. 
And what I want to play for you now is a short film that was actually produced by this war relocation authority that shows some of the conditions inside the camp. We actually play uh, this whole film inside of the exhibit. Uh, it's, I think it's like 17 or 18 minutes, right? So you're just going to see like a minute and a half or so, but at least give you a sense of what some of these camps might have looked like. Um, teachers, just so you know, for a couple of the videos that we might play today, for some reason, those are always a little bit quieter than me <laughs> when I'm talking. So you might want to turn up your speakers just Relocation center, housing from seven to 18,000 people, barrack type buildings divided into segments, 12 or 14 residence buildings to a block, each block provided with a mess hall, bathhouse, laundry building, and recreation hall, about 300 people to a block, the entire community bounded by a wire fence and guarded by military police, symbols of the military nature of the evacuation. Each family, upon arrival at a relocation center, was assigned to a single room compartment, about 20 by 25 feet, barren, unattractive. A stove, a light bulb, cot, mattresses, and blankets. Those were the things provided by the government. The family's own furniture was in storage on the west coast. Scrap lumber, perhaps some wallboard, and a great deal of energy, curtains, pictures, drapes, depending on the family's own ingenuity and taste, helped to make the place livable. Some families built partitions to provide some privacy. Others took what they received and made the best of it. The 300 or so residents of each block eat in a mess hall, cafeteria style, rough wooden tables with attached benches. The food is nourishing, but simple. A maximum of 45 cents a day per person is allowed for food, and the actual cost is considerably less than this, for an increasing amount of the food is produced at the center. A combination of oriental dishes to meet the taste of the Issei, born in Japan, and of American-type dishes to satisfy the Nisei, born in America. Okay, so now I'm actually going to turn over um, uh, the webinar to uh, Kim Guise, who you see right here. Uh, she is the curator of our latest special exhibit. You can see the title of it on the screen here, From Barbed Wire to Battlefields, Japanese American Experiences in World War II. Now she's gonna give you an inside look, show you some of her, uh, some really interesting artifacts um, inside the exhibit and maybe something a little bit special at the end, right? Maybe. <laughs> All right, so here, everybody welcome Kim with a virtual round of applause. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad to be here virtually with you. Um, as Chrissy said, I'm a curator here at the World War II Museum. And I am anticipating that some of you might want to know what a curator does. I often get that question from people. What does a curator do? So I'm going to give you a little look at my day. Um, at what, you know, what I might do on any given day. And it's not just working with exhibits, but I do quite a different range of things. Um, I speak on different topics here at the museum and then virtually as well and, and out in the public. I do tours of our collection. I talk to people who have artifacts from World War II or stories that they want to contribute to the museum. And then I help to organize, catalog, and maintain the collection of artifacts and stories that we have. And that's about, um, that's over 100,000 artifacts. And really about 1% of what we have, less than 1% really, is out on display at any given time. And um, that collection includes around 50,000 photographs, 7,000 oral histories, stories from people who um, experienced World War II, and then larger pieces like um, our aircraft and Sherman tank. So um, just to give me some street cred here, I have a, a license to drive a forklift here at the museum. And I also got to ride on our Sherman tank this morning um, when we moved it around our exhibit hall. So those are some of the things that I do um, maybe on a daily basis. 
Um, but I also work with exhibits. So some of the most exciting and challenging work that I do is to help bring our artifacts and stories to the public and to students. And that includes our latest special exhibit, From Barbed Wire to Battlefield, Japanese American Experiences in World War II. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So this is a special exhibit that's in our special exhibits gallery. It's up from, um, it opened in March, March 15th, and it will be, it will run through October 20th. So it's up for quite a while, and we have the opportunity to run programs like this one um, during the run of that, of the exhibit. Now, this is a pretty big story, and, and I was pretty intimidated in, um, at first, in trying to figure out how to piece all the, um, pieces together. It, there are a lot of stories um, within this, this big show. So um, the planning began about over a year ago, um, where we, um, a group of us got together to try to figure out um, how to tell this story. And it's a pretty big story. So we're trying to tell not only the story of the imprisonment of Japanese Americans, but also the military service portion. Um, and that's a very important story for us to tell here at the National World War II Museum as well. So we began to try to assemble artifacts and stories. And um, we found that we didn't have a lot of pieces in our own collection. So the museum's um, collection was relatively small related to the imprisonment of Japanese Americans. Um, and so that was part of my job is to try to find artifacts and stories that we could um, tell the story through in our show. And um, I'm going to have Chris oh, yeah. forward this yeah, slide, sure. or I can forward oh, no, I got it. <laughs> yeah. So this is one of the pieces that I wanted to talk about. And some of these pieces um, you can actually see on our website. We have a website for the special exhibit. Um, and then we also, for this piece, um, this, this piece is on two um, websites from the museum. This is a yearbook. Now, this yearbook was produced in Rower War Relocation Center, and that's one of the camps that was located in Arkansas. And the title is Resume 1944. So this yearbook, you can flip through. I scanned, as part of my job as curator, I scanned the entire yearbook, um, each page, and we have it um, presented in a digital form on an iPad in the exhibit but then also on our website. So afterwards, you can go and flip through the entire thing if you're interested. Um, so this yearbook looks like a typical high school yearbook. Um, yearbooks produced during the war, but then yearbooks produced today as well. So you can see the portraits of the students. Um, now the difference here is that their classroom, um, what did their classroom look like? Well, their classroom looked a lot like the barracks that they lived in. So their classroom was a barracks. Um, one source I came across referred to as the classroom as um, a little gray school barracks. So you can see, um, yeah, there are some more images right there from the yearbook, um, the rower yearbook. And you can see the school classrooms located on the top right picture. And they're having an assembly and pledge to the flag. And then you can see their school barracks around around that. So um, students in war relocation centers, um, kids um, had to go to school. So life continued, and that was difficult to um, to normalize life. So life didn't stop. Um, people tried to um, set up schools right away. Education had to continue. So it was a very important part of life in the camps. Sure. So here's another artifact we have in the exhibit. And this is a wooden ironing board. So you saw earlier that you had to leave, people were forced to leave their homes very quickly. And you could only take a small amount of, um, of items with you. And so um, a great number of of items, household items and ordinary items had to be made handcrafted with scrap wood oftentimes. And you saw this, I think, in the film Challenge to Democracy. 
Um, so this is one item that was handmade in one of the camps. We're not exactly sure which one. Um, this is a piece that we borrowed from the Smithsonian Institution. So because we have few artifacts, we turn to our um, partner, we're a Smithsonian Institution affiliate museum. And, and so we were able to borrow 16 pieces from the Smithsonian's collection. And those are all included in our exhibit. And these are two of the artifacts. So this is the wooden ironing board that's made out of scrap wood and also an iron. So you couldn't just go out, leave the um, imprisonment center and go to a store and buy what you needed. Um, you had to um, make do either by making things or then also um, catalog shopping was available. So similar to what we would do now um, with online shopping, um, the iron that you see in the picture on the right um, was not handmade, but it was purchased um, from the Sears catalog. So you could order things um, in the mail. So those are these two items from the Smithsonian's collection. And the third piece that I'd like to talk about in our exhibit is related to the military service of Japanese Americans. And this gentleman that you see right here, Yeki Kabashigawa, is actually from Hawaii. Um, so the population of Hawaii was a little bit different. I know that we have some visitors um, in our um, classroom today from the West Coast and from Hawaii. Um, and unlike the um, Japanese American population here on the mainland, um, those of Japanese descent were not incarcerated in Hawaii. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that, but one is that um, th around 30, over 35% of the population in Hawaii was of Japanese descent. So it was, that made it pretty, um, pretty impossible to, to do mass incarceration. So it was a very different situation. And Yeki Kabashigawa was um, one uh, Hawaiian volunteer who served in the Italian theater. He was with the 100th Battalion and they are profiled in our exhibit and on our website. And he received the Distinguished Service Cross in June 1944, two days before D-Day, I think, June 4th, 1944, in Italy for extreme bravery. So he risked his life to take out a German machine gun nest. He was under fire, and as was his unit. And he received the Distinguished Service Cross. Well, in 2000, um, there was an investigation that um, that revealed, that ruled, that there was discrimination in the awarding of medals during World War II and, and later conflicts as well. And 21 Japanese, um, Asian Americans received the Medal of Honor as a result of that investigation. So their medals were upgraded. And Yeki Kabashigawa was one of those who received the Medal of Honor in June 2000, you can see there he um, there there is President Clinton um, presenting a Japanese American. I'm not sure if that's Yuki Kabashigawa oh, actually <laughs> um, with with the medal um, at the White House. So it was a very exciting time. And some of you may know may have heard that this um, upgrading of medals happened recently as well. So um, 21 medals of honor were awarded recently this past year um, in March. And here is the medal as presented in our exhibit. So we actually have the Distinguished Service Cross that he received during World War II, and then the Medal of Honor that it was upgraded to in 2000. So we're pretty excited. These are loan pieces from, from Yeki Kabashigawa's daughter. She brought them from Hawaii and they're um, presented in our exhibit for the duration of the show. So I brought a special piece. Chrissy gave you a little teaser, <laughs> so I have to show you now. Um, this is one piece that's not out in the exhibit. I'm going to put on my white gloves um, that we use to handle artifacts. So this is another piece you can see. This is a yearbook here as well. Um, this is a 1945 yearbook called Ramblings. 
It is from Topaz, which our next presenter will um, talk about. Um, so this is a yearbook from the Topaz War Relocation Center in Utah, 1945. And this is a very recent acquisition, so it's not out in our exhibit. We did purchase this off of eBay. So that's another one of my jobs as a curator is to look for artifacts, as I mentioned, and that includes online sources. So unlike the other yearbook, this one has a great number of signatures. So I know you won't be able to see, but it's very similar um, format. So the photos, photos of the basketball team, photos of the glee club, student council. Um, but then there are also signatures. And some of them are pretty interesting. Um, I can read a couple Lots of luck to you on the outside. Gee, it's been a lot of fun knowing you, knowing a swell gal like you. So some pretty neat signatures from people in the exhibit. So this is one of our latest acquisitions. And that you guys got a sneak peek of. Right, uh, you're the first people to really yeah. see this here, <laughs> outside of our staff. <laughs> All right, Kim. Well, I want to say I'm going to wheel back in here, actually, and say a big thank you to Kim. And you guys can actually, um, I get a little closer to you here. <laughs> uh, you guys can actually uh, keep asking Kim questions throughout the presentation. Uh, we, we welcome that. But um, now I think I'm going to actually bring in our second presenter for the day. Uh, this is a really special webinar. You guys get two special guests, <laughs> not just one. It's a big deal. Um, and that is uh, Brian uh, Comey Dempster. And Brian, if uh, you're there, I, I actually I know you're there. I can you there. But I would love you for to turn on your webcam and, and your uh, microphone now, so we can also see and hear you as well. Um, but while you do that, how about I, I I'll introduce you too. Um, so actually, you guys, maybe, uh, there he is. Let me get my book out here. Um, you all in your classroom maybe have um, read uh, or at least uh, looked at parts of uh, two of Brian's um, books. Uh, Topaz, which we'll be talking about today, and Making Home from War as well. Um, so uh, Topaz, his debut of uh, poetry, book of poetry, was published by Four Way Books just this past year in 2013. He's also the editor of um, here, Making Home from War, thank you, Kim, uh, Stories of Japanese American Exile and Resettlement, and also uh, From Our Side of the Fence, Growing Up in America's Concentration Camp. Um, and uh, his Poems have been published in uh, numerous reviews and anthologies. Uh, Brian is joining us today. I think I'm thinking of the end of a very busy school year, right? Uh, he's the professor of rhetoric and language and the faculty member at uh, the Asian Pacific, American, uh, Asian Pacific American Studies at the University of San Francisco. Currently, in addition to doing this today, uh, he divides his time between um, serving as director of administration for Master of Arts um, uh, in, Asia, uh, in Asian Pacific Studies and teaching, of course. So, Brian has a very busy schedule, but he is awesome enough to join us today to tell us a little bit more about... Okay, and before you leave, I want to... Is the sound check? Is, is everything coming through on audio? And then we're going to go away and uh, let you take center stage here. Okay. I, I can hear you, and actually, I think you might even be coming through a little louder than me. Okay, well, I, I hope I'm not too loud. I'm going to give the teachers just a moment to adjust their mics if they need to. And I will start in about 30 seconds. You can project better than I And while you are adjusting your mics, I just want to give a huge thanks to Chrissy Gregg and Kim Guys for their amazing work. I'm very honored to be invited to do this webinar. And I'm really impressed by the work that you do at the museum. It's just very, very heartening to see such important work being done on World War II and, in this instance, the exhibit that you just spoke about. So I'm going to get started and welcome, everyone. It's morning over here in San Francisco. You're going to go away? OK. So just type, type something to me if there's any audio issues. Otherwise, I'll assume we're smooth. So 
Good morning to everyone here from San Francisco. I know that it's two hours ahead there. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to speak to you for about 20 minutes. The first portion of the presentation will be a looking at of the writing projects that I've been doing with the Japanese American community. And then the latter part will be reading some poems that are connected to my family history and the World War II incarceration. So, and what I'll be doing is I'll be queuing Chrissy on the slide, so you'll hear me doing that. So, Chrissy, could we have the first slide, please? In any case, I'm going to give you a quick overview. In the late 90s, I was asked by a group of Japanese Americans here in San Francisco to teach a writing class to them in which they would document their experiences as former camp prisoners who, as children and teenagers, were incarcerated during World War II. Many of them were in Topaz, the place that Kim mentioned. And the first book that you can see on the left side from our side of the fence was published in 2001 by Kearney Street Workshop. And the book in the middle, Making Home from War, is more focused on the post-war resettlement experiences. It's the same group of writers, but focusing more upon 1945 to 1955 and their experiences after the war, which is a somewhat neglected area in terms of storytelling. And in the final book, My Dog Tenny, is a children's book based upon one of the stories in From Our Side of the Fence by Wayne Osaki. And it's this very, very moving story about having one's pet taken away at the time that one is taken away from their home in San Francisco. In this case, Wayne Osaki was very, very close to his dog, Tenny. It's about their relationship and how he lost his dog at the moment that he was taken away into the camps. And so it's, it's incredibly powerful. And it's very similar to the story that I believe many of you have read by Marianne Furuyuchi on the website. And it's about her pet and, and that relationship. So that is a common theme of things being taken away and the emotional trauma associated with such. Next slide, please. So anyway, in the next slide, it's just a, a closer cover shot. And that photo is pretty interesting. It's actually of the first Japanese American family to leave Topaz after the war. Notice that they're dressed in their Sunday best, which expresses a sort of dignity despite the injustices done to them. And there's that big metal suitcase. You know, this phrase, only what we could carry, is a resonant phrase among Japanese Americans relating to what they took out, both physically and emotionally. OK, next slide, please. So I just wanted all of you to be able to see a visual representation of what we have in our books. And this, for those of you who are visual learners, you students out there, there's also so let me see. Here you go. Some more maps inside the book, Making Home for More. This particular map takes a look at where the Japanese Americans returned to after they were released from the camps in around 1945, 1946. So transitional housing really means they couldn't return to their original homes in many instances. So actually, a lot of them, who are all from the West Coast, they actually had to go to New York, Ohio, Missouri, Utah, wherever they could find work and a place to rebuild their lives. So I hope that you take a look at the book and the maps, because I think it gives a good visual representation of the stories. OK, next slide, please. So I wanted you all to be able to see an example of a writing prompt that I gave the writers who are in those anthologies I just described. This one is focus on an object that you lost during the war or that you missed during camp or after your release from camp. What memories are connected to the possession you lost? And referring back to my dog, Tenny, and the story by Marianne Furuyuchi, that's an example of what would have emerged from such a prompt. So in this case, it would be a family pet. But in other cases, it was a piano, it was a bicycle. You know, in Michi Toshiro's story that some of you may have read from the lesson plan, she talks actually about a swing. And it's not something that she lost literally, but it reminded her of her childhood and sort of those things connected to nostalgia and innocence, yes. So that's an example. We actually have other writing prompts, a whole set of lesson plans in the back of each anthology. 
And those are for both Japanese Americans who wish to tell their own stories, also for educators and students like yourselves who want to look at the actual pedagogy and teaching template that I use, because I know you're all teachers and learners out there. So you may find it useful in your own research, in your own sort of projects that you're doing in class. OK, next slide, please. So I just want you to see a couple of the author profiles that are in Making Home for More. This is Daisy Satota. She is also in the lesson plan. She wrote a story called The Red Coat, which is pretty powerful, once again, about a particular object that is connected to camp and after war experience, and how that red coat becomes valued in the camp, but once she leaves camp, she actually feels inferior because it looks very cheaply made in relationship to what others are wearing. So I won't give it all away, but the red coat is, is a really great story for the lesson plan. And she was in Topaz. So if we can go to the next slide, you will see an example of King Cafe is a cafe that her family opened up after the war. It's a very colorful, place of diversity and African Americans and Japanese Americans intermingling. And that's the final story of her section of the book. And we always included photos to accompany the stories to give you as students, you as teachers, a clear picture of what was happening, not just in terms of text, but visual representations that go with that and the maps, OK? OK, so next slide is Michi Tashiro. And again, she's another of the writers in the lesson plan that you all have. And she was actually in Amachi, Colorado, that camp. And that's one of the WRA camps in addition to Topaz that Chrissy and Kim have referred to. And the next slide actually gives some pretty cool pictures. They, one is related to her being in the Turlock Parade on July 4th, which is actually coming up in a few months and as you know is Independence Day. But she has a really interesting story about that sort of notion of being American and loyalty and what it means to be in a July 4th parade in terms of the incarceration experience. The other drawing is actually done by, I believe, her brother. And it's about behind the shack where they lived after the war, you know, the bathhouse and, and so forth. So there's some pretty interesting things that I thought you'd like to see given the artifacts and exhibits that Kim and Chrissy work with at the museum. I consider these to be a sort of artifacts and exhibits as well that go along with the stories. OK, next slide, please. So what emerged from the anthology projects that we worked upon was that we wanted other Japanese Americans to be able to tell their stories. As great as it was to have 12 to 13 people in the published anthologies, there's thousands out there who hadn't told their stories. So as you can see, www.niseistories.org is another project that we are gratefully funded by the California Civil Liberties Public Education Program, which funded both anthologies and this follow-up website. As you can see from the slide, it provides workshops for former camp prisoners to record their stories. And then those stories get put onto a website which has equal access to all of you. So all of you listening to me today, you should go to this website and check it out because it's going to be there forever and you're going to be able to use it as a research you know, resource, educational resource. And we will keep adding to it over the next couple of years and onward. So we're getting a much wider reach to this website project than the original 12 writers, which is what's so exciting. So if we, and, and I think that those of you who did the lesson plan did a couple of the stories from there by Marianne Furuchi and Sumiko Higaki. So I think many of you have read two of the stories from this website. OK, the next slide that I want you to see is just a quick screenshot. And that's me doing a great teaching you know, in one of the workshops for the website. So next to me is my friend Toru Saito, one of the actual anthology writers who served as a sort of peer mentor in the workshops. Because for the Japanese Americans, it was a pretty daunting task to tell their stories. And he helped give them that sense of courage and bravery to tell their stories. So OK, there, there's sort of the opening page. The next slide just gives you 
you know, here's an example of George Yoshida. He's a jazz man. He's a sort of musician. He comes out of the camps. He ends up in Chicago. And his story is about that whole jazz scene and music and how music helps to be a redemptive force after the war and to recover from the camp experience. It's, it's a pretty cool story he tells, and you can check it out. And there's the bio as well, which represents how all the author profiles look on the website. Okay, next slide, please. So I thought you'd be interested in seeing this one because I know this intersects with some of the work at the museum. This is a piece by Funi Nihei. And what she did, she wrote in the voice of her brother, who was in the 442nd Regiment. And that's an actual portrait of her brother, Ken Nihei. And you know, going along with the museum exhibit, here's yet another artistic representation of the stories that we tell. So she did this thing, what's called a dramatic monologue, when she writes in the voice of her brother in order to make the story more powerful. OK. So the next slide, I just wanted you to see Marianne Furiuchi, and many of you have read this Lucky and the Horned Toad. It was the story I referred to earlier in terms of the lesson plan. And she also wrote the story about losing the pet, as Osaki did in My Dog Tenny. So I think a lot of you students out there, you young people who have pets, you know, I think you'll find this very, you know, a way to connect to what happened during history and for you to imagine yourself in that situation if you lost your own pet, how devastating that might be. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next slides, and now we're going to transition into poetry. And this is the cover of my book. I won't say much about it in the interest of time, but it's a beautiful portrait. And the, the artist is just amazing. She does these collages. And I want to make sure I get her name right. But I believe her last name, it's Masumi Hayashi is her full name. Anyway, she does these amazing collages. And it was the perfect representation for my book, Topaz, which is obviously named after the Utah camp that was referred to earlier. And the next slide, I thought you would have a fun looking at the next slide. It's me in action in San Francisco reading my poetry. I've done about at least 12 to 15 readings since the book came out. And this particular reading, some of the actual anthology writers are in the audience. So I thought that would at least give you a sense of, of me reading, because I'm about to read you some poems. Okay. So next slides are, I'm going to give you a quick overview. This is the Nichiren Buddhist Church of America, and that was founded by my grandfather in 1931. It's in San Francisco's Japantown. And this is where my own maternal family was taken away during the war. My mother and her mother and my aunts and uncles were put in topaz in Utah. And my mom was only about, you know, one years old at the time. And then my grandfather, Archbishop Niti Nishida, he was taken to Department of Justice camps, where separate camps where many of the quote-unquote dangerous or those deemed dangerous as community leaders were separated from their families. So I will then move you to the next slide before I read the poem so you can see who my grandfather is. This is him in his full priest garb, right? And this is called a kesa, part of the garb. And this is what he wears during the Buddhist services. So that's an old portrait of him, so you can visualize him. And then I'm going to, next slide, please, would be a more recent portrait. And he did pass away in 1996. But this is him doing calligraphy. And I wanted you to be able to see him in action doing calligraphy, because that's referred to in the poem that I'm about to read. So I think we could just leave it on this slide. Actually, let's go to the next slide. OK, so I'm going to read you a poem. And it's called Your Hands Guide Me Through Trains. And it's really dedicated to my grandfather, who you just saw pictures of. So imagine this journey through time. And I'm addressing my grandfather, both his experience during the war and then as he ages, attempting to reconcile the past and the present. So this poem moves through about 50 year time period. And there are some references to some of the camps later in the poem. Missoula, Fort Sill, and Crystal City are some of those camps. I'm going to read it. Your hands guide me through trains. From the bridge, we stare down at the track, searching the arch, where rails curve out of darkness. You lift me on your shoulders, and we balance in white light. 
the dead center approaching. The whistle blows, a rumble climbs through the bones of your feet, through your legs and hands into mine. Your right hand clenches my right. Your left hand clenches my left. If this were 1942, my hands would be the handle of your suitcase and your purple book scripted in prayer. Torn from family, you board a boxcar. Snap open your case. Set your brush and ink to the right. Stones to the left. Paint your own sea and coast as the plains, grass, and ironwoods battle by. You dip the brush in each camp, in each barrack. Fill the paper with kelp and jellyfish, pebbles and shells. Tape the sheets side by side. When it grows dark, you draw tracks leading to the edge of the tide. Asking for water, your hands unclasp and cling to the wires as men rip the sash from your back. A rifle butt knocks prayer loose from your throat. But it is 1976, a Sunday like any other. When you drape beads over my wrists and open the Lotus Sutra on the bridge, anchor its pages with stones, offer prayers as the train rushes under our feet, our lungs flowering with soot and steam. For years I traveled to your hands, unrolled ocean scrolls from your case. In barracks you'd held the brush, painting your way out. By 1996 your brush strokes fade, washy crumples in my palms. Your fingers grip a cane, waver with chopsticks. Soup, tea and rice, sprig your bib. I feed you, brush your teeth, my right hand clenches your right, my left clenches your left. I lower you in the chair, place your feet on the steel ledges. Grandfather, can we run just once through the gravel, a long silver rail, watch flames curl off the faces of men smudged in coal? Can you take me to Missoula and Fort Sill? Wheels circling back to Crystal City. We arrive at the church where you live, and I wheel you past rows of empty chairs, drape the sash over your back, strike a match, light sticks of incense. Your hands guide me through the years like a black iron rope into the orange glow, a tunnel of smoke, pages returning us to the shores of our home. Thank you so much. So the final poem I'm going to read, if we can go to the next slide, it's a very short poem. And then we'll move on to Q&A. So it's called Temple Bell Lesson. And the reason I want to end today's formal presentation with this poem is that it's really about you, the younger generation, and how you carry on these legacies. So you out there, you students who are listening to this, I want you to think about the history you've learned during the academic year. I want you to think about the stories, the museum, the exhibits, everything that we've given to you today. And think about what you might want to do with that in the future, whether you're a historian, whether you become a teacher, and, and whether you go into any type of field, what is the importance of transmitting that history and knowing that history of America, this great country we live in. So this final poem, Temple Bell Lesson, is dedicated to all of you as well as my son. And it's just about this huge temple bell in the church. And you know, as a one-year-old, I'd put his head inside there, and he would laugh and giggle, and then I would lightly ring the temple bell, and he would smile. But there was also a great gravitas to this moment. And this poem is just called Temple Bell Lesson. OK, Temple Bell Lesson. Son, I am weighted. You are light. Our ancestors imprisoned, outcast in sand, swinging between scorching air and the insult of blizzards. 
their skin bronzed and chilled like brass. Listen to their sorrow ringing. Okay, and thank you so much. The final slide is just really, if you're interested in seeing more about the projects that I spoke about today, and if you want to get updates on the latest readings and presentations I'm doing, you know, feel free to like me on Facebook. You know, that's great. And feel free to use this as a resource oh, wait, for yourselves I, and for I your class. My mic is like loud as Thank possible. Thank you so much. And I think <laughs> so we're now moving you and I are, um, You know, we're, we're coming through at the same volume. Um, I, I received a lot of uh, really interesting questions, you know, while both of you were talking. Um, unfortunately, sorry, students, we can only answer, you know, a couple of them uh, today. But actually, Brian, I thought I would toss the first one to you, if you don't mind. Um, I think students picked up on that we were using the terms imprisonment and incarceration. And one of the students wanted to know why we did that, why we referred to it as imprisonment. And seeing Sierra, professor of rhetoric and language, I thought I'd toss that one to you. Does that sound good? Yeah, I can, I can be fine. So hopefully that means everybody else okay, can too. Sure. <laughs> So am I coming through enough to you guys, or can you hear me? OK. So you know, I was talking to Chrissy about this, and I would say that the terms imprisonment and incarceration are actually interchangeable. And in terms of historians and this ongoing debate or discourse about these terms, that would refer to the entire number of Japanese Americans who were put in camps during the war, including the WRA camps that Kim mentioned, Topaz, Amachi, etc., but also Department of Justice camps that I mentioned, which are a, a bit, they're not quite as known in a way, but they are a smaller group of camps, or I should say a smaller group of people were put in those camps, and those are really like my grandfather or other community leaders. Now, Technically speaking, those particular camps, Department of Justice camps, historians refer to those as internment camps, right? So it gets very complicated, but the internment camps are included within the definition of imprisonment and incarceration camps, right? So that it's, it's almost like the umbrella is imprisonment, incarceration, internment is yeah, one that, segment that of that. That makes sense. Yeah, and we just, um, with a lot of students here and teachers, they probably know that, on, but, that but term that internment the most, so I'm sure they were curious you know, as to why, you know, we were, uh, you know, using uh, the, the language that we use. And use, um, can you talk, what, what language do we use in the exhibit? Well, we do actually address that very mm -hmm. um, question, why um, internment, and how the language that people have used to describe this experience has evolved over time. So um, most people know the um, the most common experience as internment. However, um, it's people are evolving a little to in the more um, appropriate terms of incarceration and imprisonment. Well, thanks both of you for sharing your insight on that. Then, Kim, I have kind of one that's maybe a little bit more geared toward you, but I think Brian, if you want to chime in too, at one point, you can. I had uh, one student ask if that if prisoners were allowed to bring, you know, Japanese flags or you know other items that might appear as potentially, you know, controversial, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think one important thing to remember is that um, over 60% of the people that were taken to these camps were American citizens. So their flag was the American flag and the stars and stripes. And so they, um, most of them had not even been to Japan. Many of them didn't speak the Japanese language, so they were Americans, um, and uh, and Japan was the enemy nation at that point. So um, there was material that was contraband in the camps. People were not allowed to bring weapons, um, for, so that included um, swords. So some people had um, made um, family heirlooms, um, samurai swords, or, or other um, types of items that were, they were not allowed to bring into the camps. And also, um, 
radios and radio receivers and cameras initially um, were not allowed in the camps. So those were some items that were not allowed. Great, thanks. Um, Brian, actually, kind of a personal question from you, from a student. Uh, you, you showed um, the uh, Buddhist uh, temple uh, a few slides ago, and they were wondering, did your grandfather build that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, my understanding is the building is already there, and of course, once they occupied the building, I internally they really sort of redecorated, really, really changed the inside. Now, I wish I could have shown you the inside, but, you know, there, there's really, as you walk through the front door, there would be the temple bell to your right that I mentioned in the poem. And then you're really in the altar area, which has many artifacts or objects from Japan, such as a taiko drum. It has the priest altar with marble pots of incense and actual swirls and plaques that elegize, you know, church members who have passed away. And then actually his calligraphy lines the walls on both sides. So, you know, the, the inside of the church, I think, is mainly what yeah. they focused on. But that building, as I understand, was already impressive. there. It yeah. would be great well, if I could say he built it perhaps, from, you know, too. scratch. Um, now, but, I, but I do here. not believe that. Um, is yeah. Tim, I have a couple people. I'm just looking at questions now. Who I've got a lot coming in. Maybe I can do, maybe if not one more, maybe two more. This one is for uh, you, Kim. Uh, someone wants to know a little bit more about um, the service of Japanese Americans in the military during World War II. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, um, Japanese Americans, um, many of them had to fight to be allowed into the military. Um, and uh, 33,000 served in the military during World War II. So mainly in the segregated Japanese American units of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and the 100th Battalion. Um, that included Yeki Kabashigawa that I talked about earlier. Um, but then also 6,000 Japanese Americans served in the military intelligence service in World War II. So they actually served in the Pacific Theater, interrogating and translating um, documents and prisoners of war. Um, so that's a very interesting service um, that you can learn more about on our website as well. And, and that is featured in, um, in our exhibit for War the Battlefield. I know that's a very, very brief overview. but um, but you, you can learn more, yeah, yeah, on your own. That's what, that's our challenge to you. All right, Brian. I think the last question goes to you for the day, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, one student asked if uh, if you were allowed to practice religion inside the camp. Did that continue on? Okay. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question, and I think. Kim answered it well earlier about this notion of, you know, Japanese things being brought in. And I think it, it's complicated, right? Because I think that, for example, my grandfather did did practice Buddhism within the internment camp. But those in those camps, you know, all the Japanese community l leaders are together. But I do think there's a conflicted relationship with anything cultural, right? So I think that I think there was varying degrees of that. So yes, they embraced their religion, their culture with pride. But frankly, some of it may have been somewhat private because they may have been afraid of, of backlash if they were seen practicing their religion. But I do know that my grandfather told me about a few times where he did a Buddhist service for someone who had died in camp and sometimes under some very challenging circumstances. So, you know, I, that's as, as much as I could say it concisely. Like so yes, that, it was practice, uh, Ryan, but I think there was a sort of caution and, and a sort of carefulness to it. Yes, is a handcrafted altar, a Buddhist altar, um, that um, was made in in one of the camps. So that was one of the artifacts. Yeah, mm -hmm. that we yeah that we have that we can show. Yeah, in the in the exhibit. Well, you guys are awesome. Talk to the students out there. <laughs> um, I want to really thank Kim and Brian for, you know, spending this webinar with us. Um, what, you know, what we do here, I, I mean, I do distance learning with students all the time, but usually you just see my mug and, and, and not a special guest like, uh, like them. So it's really, really special to have both of you here today. 
on actually two different uh, time zones too, right? Um, connecting virtually. So the wonder of technology you now allows us to do this. So Brian and Kim, thank you so much. Uh, since it's one o'clock right now, at least central time, what I'm going to do, everyone, is tra uh, transition into our last kind of, uh, you know, uh, room uh, where I'll kind of give you guys some closing reminders and the student poetry prompt, that uh, amazing prompt that Brian uh, made uh, earlier that we hope that you guys do. And um, I'll, I'll explain a little more as we transition into that room. So it's going to take a little bit here. And it's got to think about it, of course. But. Brian said earlier, you know, um, especially with the Temple Bell lesson, you know, now it's your turn to take your history. Turn off and one way that we want you to do that today is by taking a look at this poetry prompt right here. Um, and teachers, uh, Brian was also talking about a lesson plan that was sent to you from, from me. Um, this isn't your lesson plan, a whole lesson uh, that he was describing, but at the end is this poetry prompt. But let me read it aloud for everyone uh, that's here. Imagine you are a Japanese-American child or teenager who will be taken away from your home during World War II, and you are forced to leave many of your possessions behind before you go to camp. Choose one of these lost possessions and write a poem about it. What is the story behind this lost possession? How did it make you feel when you had left it behind? How and why did you miss it while you were in camp? And students, what we want you to do is to write a poem based on that prompt. Uh, teachers, what we would like you guys to do is to email it to me uh, at that website there, virtual classroom at national www.museum.org, um, <clears throat> within the next uh, week. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, read some of those poems, see how great they are, and uh, post a selection of them um, to uh, our blog. And I will share that blog with uh, everybody who participated in the webinar and show you some of your amazing students. Uh, I'll leave it on this slide at the end so you can take a closer look at it, but I just want to have some closing reminders. Uh, number one here uh, is uh, Kim was talking about, of course, the website companion that we have to, um, to the exhibit that's here, barbedwiretobattlefields.org. There you can examine in a little bit more depth than obviously that we could go into today about some of the things that we talked about, especially um, not only in uh, these camps, but also um, Japanese Americans involved in the military. There's a lot of really interesting um, resources and close-up shots of some, you know, some of the yearbooks that we talked about as well. Um, so please, please visit that site. And then uh, I just want to say thanks to everyone for watching this year. We had four really unique, really cool <laughs> um, webinars uh, this year um, on a range of topics. And I know some of you from senior registrations that you registered for all four. So I really appreciate it, and uh, as I said, keep an eye on what's to come for the next year, 2014-2015 school year. Uh, for your teachers and students out there, have a wonderful remainder of the school year and summer, and uh, from the World War II Museum, we will see you all next year. And as I said earlier, I'm going to leave on this slide so you can take a look at the prompt. One more time, give a big